Good morning. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Craig Hoffmeister from the Ohio State University to speak about his uh, translational research in multiple myeloma. Craig uh, did his undergraduate work at Brown and then went to the Ohio State to complete his MD degree and then took a seven-year sojourn north to Chicago to do clinical training in uh, internal medicine, hematology, oncology, and then stem cell transplantation. He returned to the Ohio State to develop a career focused on translational research in myeloma. He's a uh, co-investigator on R01s looking at uh, histone D satellite inhibitors and rheoviruses as novel approaches to target and sensitize myeloma to chemotherapy and immunotherapy. He's worked on uh, NK CAR cells as another approach for myeloma, but he's going to give us something of a back to the future talk about one of the tried and true drugs with myeloma, uh, Melflan, which is Don Harvey's actual favorite drug. He keeps some in his fridge. <laughs> yeah. So with that introduction, uh, please welcome Craig Hoffmeister. Uh, good morning. I feel the uh, sincerity. Um, okay. Well, everyone's got to make fun of the Ohio State University. Um, my Twitter account is Buckeye Myeloma, and I, I keep wondering whether to put a recovering Buckeye as part of it. But it's amazing every place you go, so you say OH, and somebody in the audience go IO. So it is a uh, ever present part of the culture. Um, so uh, in the first few minutes, uh, as institution to institution, myeloma program to myeloma program, I thought I'd talk at least briefly about who we are at Ohio State and what we generally like to do. Um, so we have four uh, myeloma uh, clinicians. And we just, uh, in December of 2014, opened up uh, the new James uh, Cancer Center, uh, which in these idealized ar architectural drawings uh, look very nice. Um, and the four of us each do something different. And we divide up things based on our interests. Uh, Yvonne Efebera is primarily interested, actually, in acute graft versus host disease and phase one, two uh, trials in myeloma and especially AL amyloidosis. Claim to fame is really looking at statins for acute uh, GVHD prophylax prophylaxis and studying uh, novel therapeutics in acute GVHD. I'm interested also in phase one, two, oncolytic viruses, uh, CS1 CAR T cells and uh, deacetylase inhibition. I'm also very interested in uh, epidemiologic uh, perspectives on myeloma and created the Ohio Myeloma Initiative, which is an effort to uh, contact uh, uh, every myeloma patient within two weeks of diagnosis throughout the state. This is an incredibly difficult uh, undertaking without a lot of funding, and it remains kind of a, a labor of love. Uh, but it certainly uh, brings me close to a lot of patients who never get to come to Ohio State uh, Tertiary Cancer Center. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to do so. Don Benson is a brilliant physician scientist in our group, uh, focused, came from uh, Michael Caligiuri's lab, focused on innate immunity and uh, currently myelomagenesis. Uh, we have a uh, PD-1 trial uh, in combination with lenalidomide as a phase one, two that we're actively in, enrolling to. Um, and Ashley Roscoe is a new investigator, literally our most successful investigator per year in terms of extramural funding, uh, just recently got her K23 funded. Uh, her interest is primarily in defining physiologic age, uh, which comes up a lot in myeloma as we look at a new patient who comes into clinic and kind of get the gestalt of the patient to try to figure out if they're a transplant candidate or not, and this becomes uh, quite an issue. So this is really one of my few slides that talk in general about myeloma, uh, talking about induction and relapse uh, treatment for myelomas outside the scope of this talk. Uh, and so I wanted to get into a how I treat, uh, because this really sets the stage for my interests in the rest of the talk. Uh, so we primarily look at what defines those patients with high-risk disease, standard risk, and low-risk disease. And these are different fish probes 
that we uh, do in general and is done commonly in most newly diagnosed uh, patients on their myeloma aspirate. Uh, we do not generally use a MyPRS score, which is an mRNA-based uh, signature, uh, but was made famous in Arkansas. For treatment, we usually divide it up into treatment for the fit and the unfit. And this is partially the influence of trying to avoid age as a clear marker for what treatments are appropriate in a new, newly diagnosed myeloma patient. We often use a three-drug combination of Velcade or Bortezomib, Revlimid, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, Don Harvey's second favorite drug, uh, or uh, switching out the Velcade for Carfilzomib or Kyprolis. These patients are usually moved to early stem cell transplantation with melphalan at 200 milligrams per meter squared and then often to three drugs, so-called maintenance. And those, patient, and those patients who are unfit often receive three drug therapy, and these are all high-risk patients as defined over here uh, in a light way, which is using Velcade as a once weekly. Standard risk patients receive two or three drug therapy early on, early autologous stem cell transplantation, and then usually uh, move on to lenalidomide maintenance, and those patients who are unfit receive either a two-drug combination of continuous Revdex or MPV light, which is in general a sub-Q formulation of MPV, not typical of the standard uh, presentation and using Velcade weekly. Low-risk patients we seldom see at our, at our center, but these patients have early-stage disease, no high-risk uh, features on fish, are MRD negative, uh, and have maybe some trisomies or a 614 translocation, these patients sometimes can go on to no maintenance therapy. And that's how we treat, in general, newly diagnosed myeloma. Now, if you think of all the novel agents in myeloma, there's been quite a change, right? We started really with uh, dexamethasone, prednisone, and moved on from there to proteasome inhibitors and imids. Right now, Velcade, Carfilzomib, Ixazomib are all FDA-approved. These are three <coughs> FDA-approved IMIDs, and they're more complicated IMIDs on the way with a different mechanism of action. Histone deacetylase inhibitors, panabinostat, is uh, currently FDA-approved but poorly tolerated as it has a very narrow therapeutic index and is used primarily in the relapse refractory setting in a minority of patients. There are certainly newer broad deacetylase inhibitors or HDAC6 inhibitors that are in the, uh, in the clinic and moving on for the HDAC6 inhibitor to phase two, phase three setting. Adjuvants such as elotuzumab has no single agent activity, primarily targeting CS1 on myeloma cells. And GVAX and allogeneic uh, transplant are both uh, seldom done in uh, myeloma outside of a clinical trial in the U.S. Daratumumab was recently uh, approved in November of 2015, targeting CD38 in the relapse refractory setting in general after just one prior line of therapy. A Sanofi compound remains behind in development, and its comparison between daratumumab and the morphosis compound is still ongoing and basically pending. Nuclear export inhibitors, KPT-330, and its more well-tolerated derivative uh, remain in early clinical trial, and these remain of significant clinical interest to us as they have a novel mechanism of action and seem to have some efficacy across all heme malignancies. Uh, conjugate antibodies, BT062, is the most well-known, but certainly others exist, and these are in early phase clinical trial. CAR T cells have really changed a lot of the way we think about the, new, the next generation of cell therapies in multiple myeloma and certainly in other heme malignancies. There are numerous forms uh, of this, currently the ones targeting CS1 or SLAMF7 and CD19 have been exposed to patients. And they've been very interesting, in other words, the UPenn experience uh, well-known and, and uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine, showed a CD19 uh, car leading to a patient in complete remission and who ultimately relapsed. That trial ultimately, I think, enrolled about 25 patients, of which 24 
all relapse. The BCMA trial was recently published in Blood with Jim Fokender for FBNCI, and that was very interesting in that there were many BCMA positive relapses after initial response, and it didn't, in, in essence, the CAR T cells tended to exhaust themselves during therapy, and that may be related to their uh, actual construct they use. And oncolytic viruses, I'm not going to get to talk about today, but we're using real virus at uh, OSU, and, and certainly it's being investigated both here and across the pond in patients with relapsed myeloma. So I wanted to talk about melphalan. And melphalan is, it's, it's really starts everyone like, oh, really? Why are we talking about melphalan? We've been using melphalan for years. That's, 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 that's not novel. That's, that's not interesting. And I would uh, push to you that melphalan actually is interesting. And it is something that's ripe to do better. The important thing about melphalan is it targets both dividing and non-dividing cells. And in most of newly diagnosed myeloma patients, it's essentially twice as good as any other therapy. In other words, the time after you receive high-dose IV melphalan to the time that you need next therapy is twice as long as any other therapy known. And, but there's a problem. And the problem is very clear, is that there's a huge difference when you give a dose of 200 milligrams per meter squared of melphalan to a patient the AUC in that individual patient can vary drastically. And that changes the experience, the anti-tumor efficacy, the side effects. And it's the, trying to optimize melphalan is really what, gave, what made us very interested. And it's not like it's going out of style. And in fact, if you look at uh, this data from the CIBMCR, you can see that in 2000, 2000 2003, 2004, 2007, different eras of uh, their data set. We are doing more autologous transplants each year in the U.S. And so we're using this modality more often in patients who are usually receiving first-line therapy, yet we've not tried to optimize this therapy, in my view, adequately because it's been difficult to do. Overall, in myeloma, there's about 30,000 new cases to be diagnosed in 2016. It's only a small percentage of all new cancer diagnoses. This is uh, presumed to increase a little bit over the next 20 years, and ideally the number of deaths with myeloma will decrease. And still, greater than 50% of patients are dead in five years, and the projected survival is thought to be much different with really a splaying out of the survival curve with low-risk patients living greater than 10 years, whereas high-risk patients are still stuck in the two to four-year mark. So autologous transplant and myeloma really started decades ago using high-dose IV melphalan. Almost everyone puts up these two trials. And these two trials done in the UK and in France really started com the comparison between low-dose alkylators, regimens that I honestly have never used, VBMCP, which is, I think some, some in the room have actually used this in, my, in myeloma, but this is VBMCP versus high-dose IV melphalan. And ultimately, these were two trials that showed an improvement over sur all survival for high-dose melphalan in comparison to low-dose group alkylator-based therapy. Let's look at some more recent clinical trials looking at the incorporation of autologous transplant in myeloma. So this is an Italian group showing primarily a very large trial where patients were initially treated with revlimid and dexamethasone or lenalidomide for four 28-day courses, standard dosing, and then underwent a first randomization to do a three-drug therapy done primarily in Italy because there they use an intense amount of mutagen for support and are able to get patients through this toxic regimen of malpolin, prednisone, and lenalidomide. And they compared this, surprisingly to me, to 
tandem transplantation, two doses of high-dose IV melphalan, and then a second randomization of maintenance versus lenalidomide standard days 1 through 21. And ultimately, and to me not surprising, when giving MPR to patients and comparing it to high-dose melphalan, high-dose melphalan is a much more effective therapy. And you can certainly see that here for progression-free survival. You, you see at MPR for a median of 51 months that the progression-free survival is almost twice as long for patients who receive the tandem transplant. And the median overall survival after 51 months of follow-up is 65% versus 82%. So clear that in this trial, in comparison to MPR, high-dose melphalan is, is superior in both progression-free and overall survival. Second trial, looking at lenalidomide and dexamethasone and randomizing again here to not carfilzomib, this is cyclophosphamide, revlimid, and dexamethasone, and tandem transplantation, and a subsequent randomization of lenalidomide and prednisone versus lenalidomide alone. This ultimately showed that there was an improvement in median progressive uh, progression-free survival with a tandem autologous transplant very similar to the other trials. The design is very similar of 43 versus 28 months and the four-year overall survival, 86% versus 73%, again showing that even with the incorporation of so-called novel agents to the induction regimen for myeloma, high-dose malfoin does improve both PFS and overall survival. And then the oft-cited uh, Dana-Farber IFM 2009 tri trial is a complicated, but at least on my view, a more reasonable comparison as patients receive uh, RVD or VRD, which is lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone for one cycle are randomized at that point to receive early versus late transplant. So those folks who get early transplant undergo two more cycles. They have stem cell collection, receive four to eight more cycles of RVD, and will begin 12 months of lenalidomide maintenance. And this is compared to those patients who get early uh, trans single transplant with 200 milligrams per meter squared of malphalan, consolidation with two more cycles of RVD or VRD, and then ultimately <laughs> lenalidomide maintenance for the same period of time. There's a lot of things to nitpick about this regimen. The largest thing to nitpick is that it's a uh, international study, and the French part of the study accrued and is being analyzed years before the U.S. cohort is being accrued and analyzed. And therefore, the overall survival comparisons are going to be apples to oranges because different drugs are going to be available at, in different countries in different time periods. This data for this trial was presented at ASH last year uh, and showing that there is a progression-free survival benefit to the early versus late transplant, median survival here, 43 months, sorry, median PFS of 43 months versus 34 months. And this is statistically significant. There is no difference in overall survival as yet. So is high-dose melphalan really the answer for everyone? Well, you really have to extend it out. And you really have to look for patients who have received high-dose uh, melphalan and then they've been followed, not just for three years, not just for four years, but 14 and 20 years. And this, uh, this manuscript really looked at 344 patients. This is a Spanish group. And they had about 202 of them who were getting autologous transplant straight up front, and then 144 who had tandem transplant. They had responses assessed as a standard about three months after transplant. And then they followed these patients for an incredibly long time. And what they found in blue here, you see patients who had a CR at three months out from transplant, those patients who had a good response but weren't in complete remission, and those patients who simply had stable disease after transplant. This is progression-free survival, and this is overall survival. And really what you see is that these patients and is that about 35% if you had a CR, 35% of these patients are essentially operationally cured 
is at least what one group will say when they think about these patients. And so no other therapy really provides that level of disease control and this certainly uh, brings our interest. But this is a select patient population as these patients were essentially bad, responsive at diagnosis and then were able to move on to stem cell transplantation. To bring that point home, our international staging system in myeloma looks at beta-2 microglobulin and albumin, and our revised international staging system looks at beta-2 microglobulin and albumin, and then adds on high-risk feature based on their FISH test at new diagnosis. This is an early uh, study, almost 10 years ago now, looking at survival in patients at the IFM who've had tandem transplantation and then went on to, to have no further therapy. And those patients who had no high-risk features, no 414, no deletion of the P53 gene, and had a low beta-2 microglobulin corresponding to an early stage, less aggressive myeloma, these patients did well, whereas those patients with these high-risk features did not do well after tandem transplantation. So high-dose melphalan does not provide long survival for every patient and is unlikely to be able to optimize that characteristic for every patient. So is there any way to improve induction therapy for autologous transplant? Should we just add another drug? Will that be able to get us over the edge? Because I often think of patients with myeloma, each as, in essence, a wall. And each therapy is a step stool that you climb up to to get over the wall. So you'd think that if you can add, with improved supportive care, to a base of high-dose melphalan that you'd be able to improve the response rate and ultimate survival. Let's go through them real quick. So if you compare adding busulfan, 12 milligrams per kilo, along with MEL140 compared to MEL200 alone, is it better? No. And in fact, between these two, the transplant-related mortality essentially doubles uh, from about 3% to about 10%. And this is two different doses of busulfan and a reduced dose of melphalan compared to MEL200 alone. When you take MEL200 alone and compare it to the addition of cyclophosphamide, the standard 60 mg per pig times 2, overall they do worse. Uh, Idarubicin and cyclophosphamide plus melphalan, uh, in fact, is worse than melphalan alone. Melphalan alone, and in these, case, these patients, the transplant related mortality quadruples from their control. Combination of total body irradiation and MEL140 versus MEL200 alone also did worse with increased toxicity. Total marrow irradiation, busulfan, and cyclophosphamide in comparison to MEL200 alone also was much less chemo responsive. It wasn't necessarily more toxic. Those are all the published. Uh, randomized trials. The published or non-published non-randomized trials are a variety of things of which clearly Emory has been involved. We've used bortezomib in combination with melphalan, and I believe you're participating in a large multi-center randomized trial comparing the efficacy of the addition of bortezomib uh, to MEL200 versus MEL200 alone. The two different uh, publications put Velcade in different ways. One looked at a Velcade cycle and plopped in MEL200 right in the middle of a Velcade cycle, whereas the, your manuscript looked at the benefit of uh, Velcade before and after MEL200. So it was much more interesting coming from Emory. The Revlimid or lenalidomide uh, trial looked at high dose lenalidomide, really huge doses daily for five days in and around uh, high-dose melphalan. And finally, this ongoing trial looking at carfilzomib in addition to melphalan. I actually don't know the data from this trial. Uh, so I'm looking to see these early trials move on and see if the randomiz randomized comparison will show an improvement without increasing toxicity too much. So when, when we think about melphalan alone, we're trying to figure out, is there any way to do it better? Can we take a dose and can we somehow find a way to decrease this variability in patients such that 
we will maximize the on-target effects, minimize the off-target effects well known from Malfoy, the mucositis, the atrial fibrillation, et cetera, and improve the response and progression-free survival for that patient. So the state of the art is primarily based in this group in Australia who's published 100 patients and who've all received high-dose Malfoy, about 200 milligrams per meter squared. And then they sampled the Malfoy and, in essence, did the PK. They sampled it at 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, every hour on the hour for the first eight hours for 100 patients who received high-dose Malfoy. And what they found pretty predictably was they looked at a lot of things that they could add to their standard two-compartment pharmacokinetic model. What can we do to better predict the pharmacokinetics? Can we add age, gender, total protein, hematocrit, estimated creatinine clearance, this strange free fat mass which tries to really combine as a measure of total body weight and BMI together? What can we do to improve on that prediction? And they found that they could improve and on the base model by only about 10%. And they were able to cut down these variables to really free fat mass, creatinine clearance, and hematocrit. And not surprisingly, they found that the area under the curve, the AUC, was higher for those patients who had more mucositis, and they had a longer length of stay in the hospital. But they didn't really find a good correlation with response or overall survival with this PK model. And we used this PK model as our base. We used it to look at our sampling time for our patients. And we used it to ask the question, can we improve on their model? And as it turns out, a nursing project at OSU at the time was looking at different durations of cryotherapy for patients undergoing autologous transplant, either doing two hours worth of cryotherapy or six hours of cryotherapy. And we added on our PK interests to this trial. So it was about 120 patients, and ultimately showed that two hours of cryotherapy was just as good as six hours of cryotherapy, which, again, is sucking on ice just before you get your melphalan, during the melphalan infusion, and for an hour and a half afterwards, when patients have a peak concentration of melphalan flowing through their body, and you want to cut down the amount of melphalan that reaches your gums, because that was the number one complaint, is grade three, four mucositis. And with cryotherapy, you don't, you don't see mucositis. And of our about 120 patients, we see a standard PK curve looking at melphalan concentration time after exposure. And we learned how to do the sampling times overall. We had about 12 different sampling times for the first half of this trial and cut it down to about six in the last half of the trial as we became more confident. These patients were simply consecutive patients seen through our transplant clinic. So they were on dialysis. They had MEL200. They had MEL140, quite a range of folks, or at least as much of a range of folks as you get in Ohio. So, how can we personalize the melphalan dose? Well, there's a couple different things that we can look at. One is to look at how much melphalan actually gets in and stays in the system. One is to look at what may cause, the, change the processing of melphalan in the cell, how to repair DNA damage, and then is there anything that may speak to how each cell in our body is sensitive to melphalan and that my sensitivity is different than yours. Let's go through each one. So SLC7A5, this is a amino acid transporter, primarily bringing in leucine from the extracellular surface to the nucleus. And in exposure to HIF2-alpha, there are more of these LAT1, LAT2 transporters on the cell surface. They're brought to the nucleosome bring in more amino acids, and, and enhance mTOR1. Now, leucine and phenylalanine and melphalan chemically are very similar. And LAT1 at LAT2, LAT1 is on every cell. LAT2 is primarily in the bowel and the kidney. And this didn't hit us, but if it's in the bowel and the kidney, it's going to affect how you really process melphalan. So another trial that we knew about before starting our look uh, showed that myeloma patients, a retrospective review, 
showed that LAT1 and LAT2 expression changed overall survival. Also, this first reference here looked at SLC7A5, a particular SNP in these patients, showed that if you had that SNP, you had more mucositis, more TPN usage, and a longer length of stay after exposure to high-dose melphalan. So maybe there's something to this. So in our 120 patients, we looked at this SNP and a few other SNPs with SLC7A5, and what we found interestingly was yes, it was associated with mucositis, but it was also associated with the PK. And so that became a predictor to the ultimate model for our pharmacokinetics so that we're able to add in the SLC7 genotype for each patient. And this will help predict their pharmacokinetics. And remember, the overall goal here is to change the six-fold variability in the AUC for patients who are exposed to high-dose melphalan. Now, ANRO gets complicated, and the story is in no way complete. The ANRO Inc. 4 ARF locus looks primarily, this is all RNA here, the DNA here. These are the proteins that are ultimately constructed. The, rect the rectangles here are the exons. And what you see is the Inc. 4 B locus, P15, P16, the Inc. 4 A. These go on to inhibit, inhibit CDK and allow the RB to keep the cell in a growth phase, whereas on the other hand, the ARF ultimately inhibits MDM2 and P53, and this pathway has been shown to be very important in a myeloma cell response to high-dose melphalan. What's interesting in the new discovery is that ANRIL, this long non-coding RNA here, ultimately changes and, and manipulates the expression and transcription of the inc 4 r locus. And people were interested in this ANRIL SNP a while ago in terms of its correlation with diabetes, uh, atherosclerotic disease, and so we tested whether ANRIL, and this a few different SNPs with ANRIL, was related to progression-free survival, ultimately response in our 120 patient data set. And what we found in the multivariate model is that, yes, it did. It didn't affect the PK, but it did ultimately affect their response to high-dose melphalan and hence their progression-free survival in our patients. And we didn't look at overall survival as these patients ultimately have not reached a median, so there's not enough events for overall survival to show significance there. And what we need to do with ANRIL is extend the story and try to understand, A, in, in mouse models, but also in vitro, how does it change the response to melphalan and to further validate this. And as it so happens, in the myeloma com community, we have the recent BMT-CTN trial so that we can test the influence of ANRIL on PBMCs in 500 patients who've been exposed to high-dose melphalan. So ultimately, we'll have an answer whether in a validation set we can show that ANRIL is significant in, their res in patients' response to high-dose melphalan. Now, ex vivo studies, I always wanted this to work because I think this is cool and I don't know ultimately if this will work. When we tried it in our 120 patient group, we weren't able to get clear and consistent data like the Greek group that I'm talking about here. What they did was that they took PBMCs from a number of myeloma patients, and at the same time, newly diagnosed, they took a myeloma uh, aspirate from these patients, took their myeloma cells, and exposed both PBMCs and myeloma cells to high-dose melphalan. And they looked at various evidence of DNA damage. They looked at activation of P P53, D-globin, NRAS. They looked at adduct formation at any one of these sites. And what I'm showing you here is that PBMCs on the horizontal axis, plasma cells or myeloma cells on the vertical axis, and there's excellent correlation between their sensitivity for a patient's peripheral PBMCs and their myeloma cells, suggesting that we might have a great readout for a patient's individual melphalan sensitivity just in their blood. We don't need to try to test their myeloma cells on bone marrow aspirate at diagnosis which is classically very difficult to do and especially difficult to do for patients who've already undergone induction therapy and you're trying to test 
how sensitive their malpolin cells are to, or their myeloma cells are to high dose malpolin. So PBMCs may provide a great readout for us in the future to figure out how sensitive they are to high dose malpolin. In our hands, this worked out okay, and we wanted to do better. And we're gonna go on to that a little bit in, in just a minute. I wanted to talk about one other interesting thing is looking at DNA repair genes. In general, malpholin, as we all know, is an alkylator, cause interstrand crosslinks, DNA damage, and then your myeloma cells, your PBMCs, are all gonna go about to try to repair this. And different genes, XRCC1, ERCC1, and XRCC3, are gonna look around to try to repair the damage caused by high-dose malpholin and in vitro in our hands, low-dose malpholin. So when we did this in our data set, in our 120 patients, we did a univariate analysis looking at these SNPs for XRCC1, CC3, and ERCC1, and found that in general, all of these were mostly statistically significant uh, for time to relapse whereas gender, dose, age, creatinine clearance, none of these uh, correlated with time to relapse, and not surprisingly, whether the patient was, uh, had presence of high-risk disease did correlate with time to relapse after high-dose malpholin. So this is the univariate uh, look here, and then in a multivariate setting, only these two things uh, remained in, which, which is interesting, suggesting that DNA repair and a patient's genotype early on will be able to tell us whether high-dose malpholin will be very effective or not. This is in, a, in an experimental set and needs validation in an independent cohort. When we took our patients and looked at their IC50 ex vivo, so this is essentially taking a patient's PBMCs, all these 120 patients we had who were part of this cryotherapy trial, took their PBMCs out before they went to transplant and then exposed them to malpholin 75 milligrams for a period of time, we found a wide variation of IC50s. But this ultimately did not correlate all that well uh, with uh, time to biochemical relapse, suggesting to us a lot of different things that we may have done wrong. Maybe we cryopreserved the patient so we needed fresh sample, um, and maybe the time to malpholin exposure was not adequate to show a clear display of the variation in our population. What we did find, similar to the other group, was that AUC on the vertical axis did statistically significantly uh, predict patients' mucositis. And so patients, as you would expect, with higher dose exposure to malpholin had more significant mucositis, mucositis even despite uh, two and six hours of cryotherapy. But IC50 didn't quite uh, really vary with mucositis, suggesting that A, mucositis is not the best parameter to use in these patients, uh, but also that our uh, ex vivo studies for these patients prior to transplant could be tweaked. So theoretically, for all patients who are receiving high-dose malpholin, you could div divide up the whole group you could divide up probably about 5% of patients, 8% are super sensitive to high-dose malpholin. These are the patients who on exposure to high-dose malpholin are go gonna go on to 10 or more years of remission where the myeloma will, will remain quiet. There's gonna be probably one to 5% of patients who on exposure to high-dose malpholin will die within 90 days of transplant, transplant-related mortality there's gonna be another 5% that never recover to their pre-transplant norm. These patients have persistent fatigue and persistent quality of life decrements that last greater than six months after transplant. And there's probably another 7% of patients who progress. Those, per, those patients progress with six months and 20% of patients who are gonna progress within 18 months. Now, this group at the bottom I don't expect that we're gonna be able to change their outcome very much. These patients and all these patients from this point on 
are the group that we're primarily targeting. And the bulk of patients really are those patients who get a moderate benefit, whereas those they get high dose melphalan and they have about at least 24 to 30 months of disease quiet, but this is at a cost of a 14 to 16 day hospitalization. So when you think about the best outcome measure, you really want to marry pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and ultimately look at an outcome that really speaks to how melphalan affects this patient. So when we can look at hematocrit, free fat mass, creatinine clearance, SLC7A5 genotype, and we'd love to incorporate more of these pharmacodynamic parameters that we can do ex vivo on patients, either on exposure to melphalan or genotyping their PBMCs prior to transplant. We hope that we can use this to create a model that ultimately will predict something, some outcome measure that is available during transplant that really speaks to how a patient from exposure to melphalan, how they process it in a clinically meaningful parameter. We looked at a number of these parameters, and the one that seemed to fill out best was the duration of absolute neutrophil count. Not the time to neutrophil recovery, but how long that they were actually exposed to an ANC less than 500. This is both clinically significant. There's quite a lot of variability amongst uh, myeloma patients. It does correlate with AUC. I put this slide in mostly for Don Harvey. I honestly don't understand all of it at all in any way. I've had people, my, our pharmacokineticist, Mitch Phelps, Ming Poi, who work with me and have worked together with me on this project. Don, this is for you. And basically, what we're looking for is this is really a way to marry the PKPD parameters and the final outcome measure of the ANC and try to say, can we take an individual patient Look at, their, uh, look at all the aspects of them and ultimately predict how long their absolute neutrophil count will be. And it's a strange way to think about dosing. And most people take a minute to, think, to look at me for a while and say, wait, what are you talking about? Because I'm talking about dosing patients not on a particular milligrams. I'm talking about dosing them based on how long do you want them to have an ANC less than 500, and targeting that rather than a one-size-fits-all, everyone gets 200 milligrams per meter squared. So if you look at their neutrophil count, as we did for 120 patients, you see that after infusion and GCSF exposure starting at day plus one for the majority of patients, you have a period of expected neutropenia and then recovery of their, of their neutrophil count. You'll see this, of course, with platelets, but platelets tended to be more variable, and this provided a tighter standard deviation amongst our 120 experimental set. And we started simulating this. We could build different doses of melphalan. So this is your absolute neutrophil count. This is time after dose, and what you see is Low-dose melphalan, medium-dose melphalan, high-dose melphalan, very high-dose melphalan, you ultimately can see in a particular patient their absolute neutrophil count duration increase. And so for melphalan dose on the, ver on the horizontal axis and duration of severe neutropenia, not surprisingly, this is a, essentially a linear curve. So what's next? Well, you build an app. What to do? And you take in and I apologize that this doesn't go well, but I, you know, they really wanted to put this app in publication. So we, you can plug in the age, weight, height, serum creatinine, all the gen general parameters about a patient, their SLC7A5 genotype, and ultimately pr uh, plug in how, many, uh, how long you want their absolute neutrophil count to be, when you'll start GCSF, and it'll ultimately tell you what dose of melphalan and what their expected absolute neutrophil count will be. So you can see that we're heading towards trying to figure out dosing for high-dose melphalan instead of everyone gets the same size. Dose it, personalizing for a patient, and ultimately looking for different targets for the absolute neutrophil count. And for those of us who are mildly insecure, you'd want to know what if you get it wrong. 
ultimately you'll have an AUC that you expect the patient to be exposed to, the amount, the absolute neutrophil count you expect to have, but is there another way we could check it kind of right before it? As it turns <laughs> out, just 90 miles away in Cincinnati, they're working on this. And what they're working on is a novel way to do PK for melphalan using a small test dose. You get a 1% dose of melphalan, and they prick your finger. And they load up a sample, and within about one minute, they can get a level of <coughs> melphalan in your body after 1% dose of melphalan, and you do this prior to administration, six, eight hours afterwards, and 24 hours after receiving this test dose. And this ultimately seems to correlate, this paper spray technique seems to correlate with standard LCMS, and this has been assayed primarily in children. And so what we would like to do is be able to take our new fancy model, try to improve it, test it just before transplant with this test dose, work out the kinks, and ultimately expose patients to a personalized dose of melphalan. So we think that we can improve the response rate, survival, and reduce toxicities for high-dose melphalan, something that we're doing 5,000 times each year in the U.S. We think that a longer duration of neutropenia will improve responses without worsening toxicities, but we need to compare. So we are devising a pick the winner randomized phase two, looking at three days of severe neutropenia versus five. And we went back to our patient population and said, can everyone, is everyone expecting? Can we get somebody from three days and can we get them to have five days by varying the dose of melphalan? Because for the melphalan dose, clinicians are gonna be very uncomfortable transplanting somebody with less than 100 milligrams per meter squared and we're probably not gonna get anyone to let us give greater than 300 milligrams per meter squared of melphalan. So we're stuck within these parameters of trying to give melphalan with safely, but personalizing it uh, at the time. And we're gonna look at primarily their CR rate, and we're gonna look at their delta MRD status and PET negativity, their toxicities primarily AFib with uh, rapid ventricular rate, rate of grade three, four mucositis, and we'll stratify them based on their presence or absence of high-risk features, such that each arm will have the same number of patients with high-risk disease. And that's where we're heading with this, to try to really answer the question, ultimately, to pick the winner for, from this phase two and then compare it to standard 200 milligrams per meter squared in a phase three trial. So, this is Back to the Future. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I am on Twitter occasionally, and these are the funny things that I see on Twitter for uh, end, of, end of talk comments. So please, what, what comments or questions do you guys have?